Okay, uh, Dr. Tahmid Ahmed. Uh, how do we find a common ground? Even if we have known each other for over 50 years. Right. Right, Tahmid. Uh, you're right. In, uh, you were in public health uh, in the broadest sense, but uh, you were a scientist, uh, you were a nutrition scientist, and you have worked in various sort of areas. I'm in architecture. Uh, more specifically, specifically these days, I'm uh, interested in cities, the design of cities. How do we find a common ground in our conversation? And I say this because uh, there is perhaps a common ground because urbanization and health, they always had a close intertwined and complex relationship. Uh, especially if we look at uh, cities in Europe in the 19th century when there was a health and sanitary crisis, as we all know, which led to the founding of modern planning as we know it. Modern urban planning came from that moment in sanitary crisis in Europe. <laughs> And not only modern planning, uh, modern architecture itself, you know, the, uh, modern architecture is not just shiny cubic glass buildings. Initially, it was actually this image of very clean, white and sparse buildings, which, which came, out, came out from the fear of tuberculosis and all those things. But in any case, the question, how do you find the common ground? What do you think, damn it? Khaled. I last met you in person, I think, several years ago. And it's great to see you again. Okay. So, yes, you know, we know each other for the last 50 years, I guess. But now, mm. I think, when I go to my field of research, which is in an urban slum, and then I, when I take my rounds in the hospital that we maintain, the cholera hospital, which is very commonly known to the population in Dhaka city. I keep on reminded, being reminded about the, you know, uh, connection between what we are trying to do, the problems we face and how people live. You know, it's all about mm. living. Mm. It's all about living. When you go to a slum of Dhaka city, you will see the, you know, not only the impoverishment, but you will also see how people, they try to make up with all the limited resources. And you are amazed with their ingenuity, mm -hmm. but yet, you know, sources, resources are so scarce that, you know, um, what you want really to make up a good life is just not there. To give you an example, Khalid, you know, we are now dealing with a huge problem, you know, and this is a global problem, not just in Bangladesh. And by citing this example, I will tell you why the relation between you and I is so important, meaning your domain of architecture and my domain of public health is so important. So children, you know, they don't grow. They don't grow tall. And this is a condition called stunting. And this is a, the most common type of malnutrition in the world. And as I stalk with you, we have some 150 million children under the age of five years who are suffering from this condition, stunting. They don't grow tall. And it's not just a matter of, you know, being short. When a child is short and stunted, the brain also suffers, okay? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the brain development is impaired. So even if he grow, grows, he or she grows out of stunting, the cognition, the learning, the intellectual capabilities, you know, they remain, remain a problem. And we have found out that one of the most important causes of this stunting is a condition called enteropathy. 
you know, entero means intestine, pathy means something, you know, a problem. So it's a problem of this intestine. You know, when we take our food, it goes to this small gut or this small intestine. And mm -hmm. from there, our body absorbs all the nutrients. But if this small gut is not functioning well, then the absorption doesn't take place and we malabsorb. And when this happens to a young child, the child suffers and becomes malnourished. Mm -hmm. So the question is, why does this, you know, this uh, abnormality of this small gut take place? This is because of the life that we lead, the life in the slums, the life, you know, that is molded by the environment. Okay. Mm. So now I come to the domain of bacteria, the germs that are, you know, uh, in the environment. Okay. So when you have a toddler, the toddler, you know, goes out, touches this and that, and then uh, he puts the mouth in the, uh, he puts the hands in the mouth. Okay. So the hands are actually laced with bacteria mm -hmm. and all these bacteria are not good. So he takes in bacteria and when the mom, she prepares the food, not being very hygienic. Okay. Again, she, you know, runs the risk of introducing bacteria into the system of the child. So the small gut of the child is usually sterile, but with repeated doses of these germs going into the system, the germs take an upper hand. They make a home in the mucous membrane of the intestine, causing what we call colonization. And thereby they damage the architecture of the small intestine and the small intestine fails to absorb the nutrients. So this is enteropathy. Now, having said that Khalid, these bacteria, you know, again, now we have to go to the, you know, overall domain of a large, you know, burgeoning city like Dhaka, you know. What do we have, what do we have in Dhaka city, you know? Look at this sewerage system. We have a sewerage system that goes back, you know, before, you know, I think it was thought of during the British colonial times, but we still have that improved a lot, but still it's not sufficient to take care of the huge mega population of Dhaka city. Mm. We have treatment plans to take care of the sewer, sewerage water and other things. Unfortunately, one third to one fifth of this ends up at the treatment plans. And this depends on whom you are talking to. The rest of it, you know, goes to the rivers that surround the city of Dhaka. Okay. Right. Yeah, Buriganga, Shitalakha, Balu and Turag. And, you know, virtually it remains untreated. And this is what laces the environment, okay? And from the environment, we have the germs and the germs go into the system of the young child that I talked about. So you see Khalid, public health and architecture intimately associated with each other. You can't improve public health in the long run without, you know, looking at the architecture, without, you know, taking care of the architecture of the, of the, of the city where you are living. I'll stop here. Okay. No, that was a, an excellent uh, description of uh, where we want to go. Um, but Hamid, I'm, I'm, I'm surprised that why haven't you talked to us in such a okay. long time? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so right. um, in fact, yeah, in fact, Khalid, I, you know, uh, I am a very avid reader of whatever you write in the newspapers. You know, you write about the uh, National Parliament building, Louis Kahn and other things. And I always, you know, thought that, okay, this is a person 
who thinks about you know how to make the city of dhaka livable and perhaps not everything is negative these are the things that i you know find out from your writing i've always thought that i should talk to you about this and then came this opportunity right. and the moment you talked to me about this i said okay this is it now well, is uh, to <laughs> no no now is to tell khalid right no we will get to that maybe not today um, maybe, okay. maybe in a more organized sure. way how can we uh, form some kind of association at least you know because mm-hmm. you know uh, i also uh, direct the research institute it's not just doing um, new visioning and planning and all that but it's a research institute in a mm-hmm. multidisciplinary way but I, I, i'm trying to get back to something you mentioned and you said it very clearly that let's see let's say this child that you described in an urban slum in dhaka the child is a human person not mm-hmm. isolated from the condition around him or her and then that condition is not also isolated from a larger condition which is what you just described quite beautifully beautifully and also very uh, i would say in a in a very critical way you know the the polluted rivers the polluted environment the sewage condition which is largely the environmental condition that we right. all live in not just that young child we all live in in dhaka city and as an architect that's what i had been uh, in recent years been working on and i want to kind of uh, explain here for you and i've been doing that to a larger audience that i see architecture in a very broad way architecture is the city is also architecture the arrangement and the rearrangement of our environments for good or bad that's also architecture the moment we put up a wall that's architecture the moment we encroach on the river that's architecture <laughs> but for bad uh, consequences or good consequences so i think uh, i am working on uh, imagining the city for a future possibility where this ecological conditions and environmental conditions are conducive to what you said very beautifully the good life mm-hmm. and i i want to get to that that line make to make up a good life is not there and i want to emphasize good life because uh, the notion of a good city has been around for a long time mm-hmm. it goes back to ancient times in greece you know what makes a good city but and this is a this is a debate that has not been concluded you know Uh, it, it has not been concluded because you know with each age and with each ideology uh, the the goal the target shifts you know good city is made out of good buildings and spaces okay that's something very basic but good city is made out of sacred geometry that mm-hmm. is an ancient notion or good city is made out of good social institutions and all that but i think now increasingly we talk about good cities either in terms of social and economic equity or we talk of good cities in terms of sustainability of the environment that we just discussed and thirdly maybe that's the point we're discussing today good cities made out of healthy cities or healthy environment you know that's and maybe the pandemic has made it more uh, a more profound mm-hmm. topic so right. uh right so coming to that maybe you, you we can discuss that then you know what makes a good life which is not there right which, which is not there yeah. and therefore uh is this what some people would call therefore a utopia that you know to arrive at the good life or is it something through more scientific medicinal as as you people are doing both scientific and medicinal Uh, our health and we as uh, architects planners we can arrive at either together or partially so that is one but uh, tamit before we move on so i want to kind of go back to then talking a bit about wh- what makes healthy cities perhaps we already are into the topic mm-hmm. and i say this because in 2013 i was invited to a symposium in dhaka which was organized by icddrb and the uh, the brack university school of mm-hmm. health uh, i believe you were not there at that time i was not there right, yeah right 
No, I was a bit surprised because I was invited. I was the only architect there. Okay. And <laughs> so that's, in fact, in terms of, you know, who is inviting who, I was surprised mm -hmm. because, you know, I was invited to that forum. Because at that time, I had just published a book called Designing Dhaka, a Manifesto for a Better City. And I think that got the attention of the organizers, Ellen Adams, especially. Mm, okay. Yeah. Right. And uh, I was impressed by the, uh, the symposium. It was multidisciplinary. And their mm -hmm. call was to have a multidisciplinary forum. And I think the theme was taking actions for healthy cities. And uh, the, the, and uh, and I was I was intrigued by that, and I placed my argument, and I placed my argument from uh, something that I have picked up from Ivan Illich, okay. who is a sociologist mm -hmm. and philosopher, and I, you know I studied mm -hmm. under him for a few years, um, and he was very clear. Two things I will say, Tami, and then I will stop. That. Uh, he he wrote a book on the medical on the uh, on the professionalization of health, meaning that how health increasingly has become uh, what he called medicalized, mm -hmm. meaning mm -hmm. that it's organized by uh, the, the 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 economy and it's mm -hmm. organized by professional groups, and you can only get healthy if you enter right. a very strict category of medical services. <laughs> He was talking about Western Europe, uh, you know, right. Europe and North America, and, and it's a very catch-22 situation. And once you are there <clears> in the system, you're not insured of health, but you were insured of spending a lot of money right. and, and then actually getting unhealthy, you know, so that's the catch-22. So that's a great book uh, on, the, on, the, uh, on this sort of professionalization of health. So Ivan Illich was talking about that and also that health depends on the environment. He was very clear on that. You know, health depends on the environment. And therefore, two kinds of uh, remaining healthy. One is, well, you know, sure. Uh, he was not discarding professionalization, meaning doctors, hospitals, uh, incubator, incubators, and so on and so forth. But also the non-professional way of being healthy. So I think this point about healthy cities therefore has sort of two dimensions, the professional and yeah. professional, or the informal, the formal and the informal. Okay. So uh, a great um, uh, question, Khalid. First of all, let me tell you what I understand by a healthy city, okay? Mm -hmm. To me, a healthy city doesn't have to be a very beautiful city with, you know, uh, broad avenues, nice glass facade buildings, you know, huge apartment buildings, you know. A healthy city will have population in different socioeconomic conditions. There'll be poor people, there'll be, you know, better off people, but they should be, you know, not adequate, but basic, you know, services that are available for the population. Mm -hmm. And what does these services mean? There should be basic, you know, medical care. If, if a child, you know, suffers from pneumonia, the mother can take the child to a place where the child can be seen and treated, okay? And there should be food security, okay? Mm -hmm. And why I say this, if you look at cities like, you know, uh, big cities like, uh, you know, uh, Mumbai, uh, Kolkata, Dhaka, okay, you will see slum settlements and you will see that most of the malnutrition among, not only just among children, but also among women, that happens in slum cities. And that is true also for Bangladesh. And I'm talking about data that comes out from the large demographic and health surveys, okay? So food security is an issue. And I think the city, if it is, if it claims to be healthy, uh, it should also look into it. Then we need to have safety, okay? Why safety? Because if a woman has to walk in the evening, she has to feel safe. And the same is applicable to the children. So safety is very important to me, okay? 
And then sanitation, you know, we talked a lot, Khalid, about sanitation, how that is important and how poor sanitation, poor hygiene, you know, leads to this horrible condition of environmental enteropathy and chronic malnutrition. And finally, what I think is important is that people, they just don't live in a house in a busy city. They have to have some degree of activity, physical activity exercise. Mm. In large cities like Dhaka, unfortunately, we don't have. All you can do is to walk on the, on the footpaths. And these are not really footpaths. You can get hurt. Okay. So you need to have maidans, the grounds where people can, you know, take some, you know, do some exercise, even take a stroll for, 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 for improving the mental health. So these to me are attributes of a healthy city. And you don't need to have plenty of resources, but I think what you need is good, careful planning, okay? That can, you know, give you some of the aspects of this healthy attributes. Now, I want to stop my talking here, Khalid, by giving you an example. And here, the population living in a city also has a huge role in keeping a city healthy. So many years ago, I went to North Korea, okay? It's a, you know, it's a, it's a strange country, but I went there. One thing which I noticed was the cleanliness. Mm. Wherever I went, the streets and other places, it was, you know, clean like anything. Mm -hmm. So it was winter and it was also snowing in some parts. So I didn't find any snow on the, on the, on the streets. So I asked them. I don't see anybody, but who does it? Mm -hmm. So the answer is the place in front of your, whatever it is, office or house, it's your responsibility. Sure. Keep it clean. And the same applies for garbage and other things. Unfortunately, that's not a lesson for us, at least not in Dhaka city. The population, B, we also have a great role, but we don't think that, you know, just throwing out the garbage as it is out there will cause the garbage to return to our own house because we walk on the street and with our shoes, some of the garbage comes inside oh, the house. Right. Yes. No, uh, exactly. Uh, I want to come come back to the points you made about a healthy city, mm -hmm. and uh, I was trying to look at my notes here from that conference, and they had a call for action. And just to add to those, how to make a healthy city. Perhaps you know I, I want to go back to those points, and perhaps we can make a I don't know a write up or a manifesto or or a propaganda material, you know. Mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. this has to be served. I think the other thing is that, which was also part of the symposium's call for action is to communicate this in the public fora. Right. In a way that uh, people are drawn to it. You know, you can say a lot of things in the right. academic circuit mm -hmm. or in the professional circuit, but it mm -hmm. will not get to the places that you want it to be. So uh, I think the number one point was uh, enable community engagement. Absolutely. Uh, that's yeah. number one. And number two is uh, expand the notion of health services, mm -hmm. not to be provided only in clinics and labs and mm -hmm. hospitals and all that. Three, uh, harvest innovative approaches from the field, which is, you know, right. I was just mentioning before, uh, <clears throat> highlight them. And I, I have a few uh, you know, examples to talk about that with you today. Mm -hmm. uh, and also sharpen focus beyond health, right? right? Uh, healthy cities, you know, or health itself is not limited to health itself. You know, it's a, you know, and I think you mentioned that, it, you know, if we are part of the environment, then we are talking of a larger sort of uh, both responsibility on our side and also an understanding that, you know, we are not mm -hmm. isolated, independent 
beings whereby we can remain healthy on our own terms. Right. Uh, to be healthy individually, whether it's that little child or myself or you, mm-hmm. I think the larger environment needs to be in a conducive condition. I'm not calling it healthy, conducive. And of course, you know, collaboration between stakeholders and all that. And I think those are uh, the points that were made at that time. And I noted them down and I'm repeating them to you. And I think it ties very well with what you mentioned. And of the points that you mentioned, I will emphasize two things. One in a sort of, uh, it may seem pedestrian, but that's exactly what I'm pointing out to pedestrianism, right? Right, And uh, uh, working with my institute from 2015, I had like focused on that in a big way that Dhaka being a metropolitan city of such a scale Mm -hmm. has no pedestrianism. Absolutely. Footpaths, I don't call them footpaths. You know, I'm really, I get agitated by this because I've seen footpaths. Absolutely, yeah. Cities I've lived Mm in, even uh, even if you go to Kolkata, walkability is possible. Mm -hmm. In Dhaka, walkability is not possible. And I don't mean for leisurely strolling, which is also very important for Mm -hmm. psychological benefit, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, You need to walk, but also walking from uh, one station to another, from Mm -hmm. home to work or school. Right. And that will cut down the traffic if you could Mm -hmm. walk. Where I live in Dhaka and to my office, I can actually walk in 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. But it's, a, it's just impossible to walk, <laughs> frankly speaking. You right. Know? <laughs> right. And so I take the car, which takes me one hour. <laughs> so the whole thing is nonsense. Okay, so I, no, I, I take that as a priority and, you know, the kind of things that we yeah, do. Yeah, no, absolutely. Invest yeah. in pedestrianism or, mm-hmm. or a kind of mm-hmm. campaign for pedestrianism we are doing. Mm-hmm. Uh, In fact, uh, some of the ideas we uh, came up with in 2016, they're just very simple ideas. Come on, you know, those ideas are practiced in any city, in any sort of, you know, Mm -hmm. reasonable city anywhere in the world. You know, those footpaths, sidewalks, they are Mm -hmm. just part of the city's basic guideline. Nobody Mm -hmm. even talks about that. Uh, But we introduced those things with the the mayor, the former, the past mayor uh, of Dhaka North. And some of those were introduced in Gulshan. Okay, so, you know, a little achievement there. But uh, the other thing is social practice. You know, mm-hmm. what you mentioned about, you know, maintaining hygiene, um, proper sort of practices with garbage and all this disposal. You know, that's that's a crisis. We mentioned North Korea, you know, um, mm-hmm. where I am right now in Philadelphia. It's, it snowed a few days ago we are responsible for clearing the sidewalk of the snow. Mm. If someone falls, slips, I'm responsible. I can be sued by the city. Mm. Uh, so I have to clean. I, so the moment it snows, <laughs> it's not just a beautiful thing. Mm. I have to go out and shovel the snow mm. because I live in the city, right? You know? So I think the social practices are one thing that I, I you know, uh, I don't know. But also in Bangladesh, if, you know, Tamiri will agree that certain social practices you can improve on like open defecation, you know, mm-hmm. and uh, that, you know, if you compare with other countries, mm-hmm. how, uh, how much improvement has happened. Mm-hmm. You know, and that's with campaigning, right? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if yeah. you can talk about yeah. that a little bit as an example of how <clears throat> certain social practices, which are not uh, acceptable mm-hmm. and which have a sort of a negative impact, they can be turned around. Right. No, you're absolutely correct. And, you know, talking about open defecation, you still have many countries where open defecation is, you know, 20%, 30%, 40%. Imagine. And in Bangladesh, it has gone down to, you know, less than 1%, something like that. Yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a gone down, you know. How did that happen? Tell us. I think, yeah, I think uh, there are several reasons. Uh, Not reasons. These are my assumptions. One is, um awareness number two is shame if there is open defecation in the household in the community i think that brings a sense of shame and people you know um, they feel it and the third is you know 
with the population increasing where does one go hmm. to answer the call of nature you can't do it everywhere mm-hmm. because you know it's such a populated place unlike in many parts of you know sub saharan africa where you know mm-hmm. you walk and walk and you don't meet anybody so there you 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 know everything is free so i think these are the reasons but the reasons uh, the assumptions are for good but despite that as i mentioned we still have a lot of environmental pollution mm-hmm. that actually you know keeps on creating this problem okay let me i want to uh, find out from you one very sort of basic thing you mentioned your dis- described this child in a setting mm-hmm. urban slum suffering from malnutrition or the gut microbe now uh, you have done a lot of studies on that uh, in your data there is there a difference between the child in the urban slum versus a child in the village in terms of the malnutrition factor do you see differences yes yes so the the data that we see coming from different studies and surveys tells us that the rates of child malnutrition are more in urban slums than it is in rural bangladesh mm. to give you an example the rates of stunting you know chronic malnutrition are almost 50% in the slums of dhaka city so one in two child is stunted okay while if you go to villages of bangladesh you will find that to be around 30% something close to that so there is a big differential you know mm-hmm. zinc is a mm-hmm. micronutrient and zinc is present in animal food meat fish uh, dairy products and it's mm-hmm. essential for growth of children mm-hmm. we did a survey looking at this serum zinc levels and we found that you know children in slum settings almost 50% of them they had zinc deficiency mm. okay mm. and that was much much higher than children living in villages have so yes the answer is children living in slums of dhaka city and also elsewhere i think they are they are more vulnerable they actually suffer more from malnutrition mm. okay now uh, taking this on uh, enteropathy right Uh, bacteria and in, mm-hmm. in the intestine well uh, i have been reading on this because of you you have sent me <laughs> reading materials which i had to read <laughs> um and then of course the new york times coverage uh, last year uh well all, everyone is describing this as a global health crisis uh, you know so it's not the question of the child in an urban slum in dhaka or even in the village so it's a global health crisis so give us a sense of what kind of crisis is this in the global scale and and what are we learning from this mm-hmm. yeah i think um, as i said khalid right at the beginning of our conversation that if we talk about stunting alone you know children remaining short and their brains being affected this condition is now you know uh, involving about 150 million children under the age of 5 years so it's a huge problem i think the most common you know disorder among children whatever you think about and given the fact that you know these children have impaired intellectual capability and when they grow into adults they will have an impact on their adulthood you know productivity you know when they went on to earn a livelihood they will be able to perform less compared to adults who grew well not mm. being malnourished there is also information and evidence now that children who suffer from stunting early on 
and in whom this stunting persists, you know, these children, when they grow into adults, they have an increased likelihood of suffering from certain adulthood diseases, mm -hmm. namely diabetes and then hypertension, mm -hmm. which is raised blood pressure, all these chronic diseases. And these chronic diseases are, you know, pretty bad, you know. Mm -hmm. They run into complications, and it's a huge, huge burden on the on any on any uh, health ministry of the government. Mm -hmm. So the problems are manifold for for a population that has a very high rate of childhood malnutrition. So uh, you know, in what I was reading, uh, am I right in understanding that once uh, you are afflicted by malnutrition at that scale? Uh, simple nutrition therapy does not work. Uh, and even say better sanitary conditions might not help. So what can help? Okay. So, okay. That's, uh, that's uh, you know, Khalid, uh, a very important question. Unfortunately, I don't have an answer to it. Hmm. People are trying their best to control stunting. Bangladesh has been successful so far. You know that we have the sustainable development goals and uh, we also have a target for one of the goal. Target is to reduce stunting <clears throat> by, you know, 40%, the number of children suffering from stunting by 40% by the year 2030, okay? If you look at the target, and the way Bangladesh is progressing, Bangladesh is doing pretty well, pretty well. And I think if nothing, uh, nothing bad happens, but we don't know what COVID-19 has done already to the country. But if nothing like this happens, perhaps, perhaps the country will be able to reach the target, okay? So, the question is, what you have asked that, what are the factors that have led to this? One is definitely improvement in food security, okay? The country has improved a lot, okay? The farming, the agriculture, um, everything. And I can talk about that for another hour if you have the time and patience. Another time. But, <laughs> another time, okay. But another, um, um, other important things, that have taken place in the country are, you know, increased and improved livelihoods, mm. the purchasing capacity of the people, although poverty is still there, but I think the purchasing capacity has increased. People have access to some basic, you know, public health facilities, particularly in rural areas more than in urban areas. In rural areas, Khalid, we have community clinics, okay? Mm -hmm. Very small clinics run by paramedics, no doctors. Mm -hmm. And one community clinic caters to a population of about, you know, 10,000. So I think that's functioning, mm -hmm. although there is room for improvement. So these are the factors that have led to an improvement in this situation. Now, let me tell you about, you know, what we can do more to control stunting. Certainly, we have to, you know, overcome food insecurity. When I say insecurity, extreme food insecurity, that is happening in, uh, in a segment of the population of Bangladesh and in many countries, you know, you can, you can look at CNN and BBC and you can find out, you know, the countries. So certainly sanitation is one of them to prevent and control enteropathy. Definitely taking care of the basic health issues. That's very important. When a child has a fever, when a child has a runny nose or an upper respiratory infection, not to speak of diarrhea or pneumonia, there is a dent in the growth. He stops growing, okay? So the mother has to seek some care for the child and that needs to be made available. 
Again, very simple. For example, Khalid, if a child has diarrhea, we need to give ORS. We need to tell the mother that please do not stop the feeding. Whatever you are giving, mother's breast milk or other food, continue giving it and also give zinc. Again, the studies done from Bangladesh have shown to the rest of the world that mm. zinc indeed is essential for growth and is part of a treatment of diarrhea. So mm. these are the things that are very important. Another thing that we have found mm. works very well is immunization. So you have to immunize children. And again, Bangladesh is a good example very good immunization practices. Overall, the rates are pretty high compared to many countries in this region and also elsewhere. Okay. Um, well, that uh, brings me to ask you, Tamid, tell us about ICDDRB now uh, with, the, with the long list of achievements and breakthroughs that ICDDRB has, uh, um, well, ensured. And now you, uh, being the executive director of ICDDRB, which makes us all proud, Damid, I, I'm making it public. <laughs> how, Thank you. How will you uh, lead I, ICDDRB now? You know, what is your mandate? Okay. So... For those of you, Khaled, your audience, they might not know about ICDDRB. Right. You know, I think, Tamid, Tamid, you know, I, uh, it would be helpful to say uh, things that are obviously to you and your colleagues are like well understood. Okay. Tell us in a very basic way because you, people have assumptions about ICDDRB. Yeah, right. They have heard right. the name, but it's right. not clear. Right. Okay. So that's exactly what I was trying to say. So ICDDRB, a very strange acronym. Many people struggle to pronounce it, but we think that, okay, if you struggle, you are going to remember it. Okay. So ICDDRB stands for International Center for Diarrheal Disease Research, comma, Bangladesh. So it's an international health research organization based in Dhaka, Bangladesh. Headquarters are in Dhaka. We have a field station, major field station in Matlab in rural Bangladesh. We set up fields everywhere where we think we have to do some kind of research. Okay. Mm. Now, <clears throat> you may be surprised that the name, the title contains diarrhea. Okay. So, you know, back in early 60s, when it was established, at that time, cholera used to be a major killer. And there was no treatment for cholera. And so the cholera research laboratory was established in Dhaka exactly, exactly to find out a remedy for cholera. So there was a lot of research done by both expatriate as well as Bangladeshi researchers in Dhaka, as well as Matlab. And a large part of that research, Khalid, I'm so uh, proud to tell you, led to the discovery of a very important and landmark intervention called ORS, right. Oral Rehydration Salt Solution. And it is said, Khalid, that ORS happens to be the most important scientific innovation of the 20th century. Hmm. Because so far it has saved the lives of some, you know, 60 or 70 million people hmm. all over the world. Hmm. So a huge intervention, huge innovation. And so ICDDRB was established to take care of diarrheal diseases, but gradually, over the years, we found out that it's not just diarrhea. There are also many other problems that affect, you know, people living in low and middle income countries. Therefore, whatever affects the health and lives of people living in such geographies is the mandate of ICDDRB. Mm -hmm. We now work on vaccines. 
we now work on malnutrition we now work on social issues like domestic violence mm. we work on you know microbiology we work on tuberculosis it's a it's a major major problem in bangladesh we work on arsenic you know arsenicosis that you know again is a major problem as well as you know contamination of the environment contamination mm. of the food chain with you know heavy metals like lead cadmium and other thing so you name anything and if that is a problem for people living in such countries it mandate for us and of late we have found that a very important area is non communicable diseases you see we started with communicable diseases like cholera typhoid typhoid is still a major issue but we have been able to find out a remedy for cholera and other diarrheal diseases but you know the non communicable diseases this is going up you know mm. diabetes mellitus high blood pressure you know chronic obstructive pulmonary disease asthma heart disease all these things and this is increasing not just in cities but mm. unfortunately also among people who are living in villages so that's also a priority for us and this pandemic khalid has taught us many things like many other uh, doctors and healthcare providers in the west in the east we didn't have any knowledge about corona virus about covid 19 so we also started a fresh and not just providing you know the testing the treatment the care of our staff who are suffering acutely from this infection we also have started to do research on you know covid 19 mm-hmm. so that remains a priority too what can and you have asked me what i would do so mm-hmm. first thing is you know to have covid 19 malnutrition vaccines the mm-hmm. social issues non communicable diseases you know we will have to step up research on these along these lines because these are the problems that you know low and middle income countries face right. not just lmics these are also problems in developed countries so what we do here in bangladesh through research in collaboration with many other partners mm. in in other countries i mean the results are also going to apply to populations living in developed countries so truly it's a internationalization of the research findings mm-hmm. fantastic uh, no uh, considering the last point you made about uh, research or work you are doing or you will be doing on or, or around the pandemic i think it kind of circles around and leads to the whole notion i again of good cities the paradigm of good cities because you know there is this uh, uh, hypothesis or actually uh, a clear understanding that the, the root cause of uh, something like the covid may have been the sort of the clash of biomes you know the, the animals <laughs> that and, and the sort of the the invasion of humans right. on areas you know because of growth of cities or growth of population and all that you know and, right. and that's Absolutely. an area that's an area that's that's again an, an issue of environmental arrangement or rearrangement you know as we describe it you know and i think that's also a major area of research and uh, we particularly don't look into it but it's a concern for us and and also therefore to think about the footprint of the cities how to define describe and maintain the footprint of cities and rather than let it run amok you know mm-hmm. into anything that comes across right. which is which perhaps is one reason why these things are happening more so and therefore the danger of future pandemics you know not only this one or future pandemics you know who knows what kind of um microscopic things jump from one biome to another mm-hmm. okay so i think right that's an area of research kalan other thing that we haven't touched upon hmm. is you know 
the quality of air that we breathe mm, in sure. a complex city like Dhaka, you know, uh, the quality is so poor. And, you know, fortunately, the brick fields, many of them have been relocated from the outskirts of Dhaka city. But I think we need to do more so that, you know, the air quality remains, uh, you know, uh, breathable, okay? Right. And we don't have all these problems. I mean, again, this quality of air relates to how you plan a city, okay? Mm -hmm. The architecture of everything. And perhaps uh, uh, we are not paying enough attention to this. We talk about it, but I think we need more more action. Right, and and, and action will have to be based on research. You know, so right, right. what you're finding, yeah. what's causing them, and right. what are the uh, sort of the counter um, sort of strategy you can take to mm -hmm. you know work on that. So definitely, but also something that uh, that's. Uh, an area of research, and I don't know who is doing anything about it. So quality of the air in terms of this sort of the larger spaces of the city, but also the quality of our mm -hmm. dwellings, of our houses, from the slums to at all scale, mm -hmm. uh, where we live, you know, um, and, and, and it's not just a physiological thing, but also mm -hmm. it's a psychological thing. The whole question of, you mentioned your research on uh, mm -hmm. uh, pressure, you know, um, blood pressure and so on and mm. so forth you know living in the city you know the whole question of stress mm, uh, where are they induced from you know <clears throat> we, where are we living you know to make a good life as you mentioned you know are we having that good life so it's also a quality of you know something that i also talk about is you know our housings mm -hmm. the, the dwellings the houses our housings from the units to the neighborhood to the whole sort of complex of spaces that we inhabit, I don't think that we have done enough work on that either. You know, we take housing to be just a material thing or as an economic thing, but it's also a question of health. Right. And, and I think we also need to change our mindset. You know, mm -hmm. uh, I've seen among my relatives and friends when they want to buy an accommodation, an apartment mm -hmm. or flat, they always think and talk about, you know, about all the beautiful things mm -hmm. that they can think about. Mm -hmm. But I have never, ever heard, you know, anybody talking about, you know, how proximate the house is to a, you know, to a uh, public uh, playground, you know, mm -hmm. these things and how close is it to a, you know, walkway. These things, I think, I think maybe because um, these are lacking in a city like Dhaka, therefore people don't tend to think about it. But I think we also need to change our mindset, you know, and that's why, that's how perhaps we can, uh, we can, you know, convince the city leaders to really keep the Maidans, the public grounds as real public grounds where one can go play or even take a stroll. I mean, that's another topic that I work on, public <laughs> spaces. You know, uh, when I work on the city, I, I, I'm not particularly interested in magnificent buildings and all mm -hmm. that and let that happen. Um, I, I use a line quite often that uh, in Dhaka, architects are... Uh, making magnificent buildings, but the city is going to hell. Mm -hmm. So there is a discordant uh, situation here. Um, but I think I'd like to come down to our sort of last topic, which I mentioned earlier. And I think you already have mentioned a few things, but we can uh, wrap up our conversation. It was a good conversation. I learned a lot uh, on, um, on innovations. Because I think uh, as many people talk about that the social indicators of Bangladesh have improved vastly and much of the social indicators are around health. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and we, we need to uh, um, campaign around innovations and resilience and achievements that are happening all around. And I don't mean um, those that have happened in institutional ways as in the case of ICDDRB but also in a very sort of little things, everyday things. 
the, the, the example that I have for you, and I'm sure that may have caught your attention, this nurse who, who retired, and who is 90 years old. She was 90 in 2018, uh, and Daily Star gave her an award. Mm -hmm. She rides around villages in a bike, 90 years old woman, right. and gives uh, advice <clears throat> and little, little advice to people in remote households. And if Absolutely. necessary, she will arrange for a rickshaw van to take them to a local uh, you know, village clinic. Uh, but I was, I was very moved. You know, her name is Hiron Bewa, 90 years old, riding a bike right. in a village in Bangladesh. So an example of how, what, way, what I mentioned before, that how uh, the improvement of health is also based very much on non-professional activism, if you like, or actions. Uh, yes, I think you talked about resilience and that is one thing which, you know, we find a lot in Bangladesh. And perhaps this is one of the factors why the people always, you know, move forward, you know, such a small country, such a huge population, and so many things happening, calamities and everything, but still the country moves forward. And I think uh, one uh, factor is the resilience. You asked me to talk about, you know, about the innovations. And you also mentioned about the progress that the country has made in public health. One of the <clears throat> fastest reduction in both neonatal as well as infant mortality rates in the developing world, okay? So these are, and the longevity, you know, has also increased, you know, quite substantially. So I think, the major innovation that I would think is the public health care system. Mm -hmm. That, you know, is working in Bangladesh. You go to any village and ask, where do you go? He or she will tell you that, yes, either she goes to the Upazila, the sub-district health complex, mm -hmm. or she goes to the community clinic where she will find somebody to talk to. Okay, so these are the things that have been set up and I think they have started to change the health face of the country and Bangladesh really is a model, but I think we need more. And this is what we call, there's a term for this Khalid, we call it universal health coverage. What does this mean? This means that all the interventions, healthcare, you know, facilities, you have to extend to the grassroots level, okay? So the people living in village, they have to have the access to everything. So in case of a difficult, you know, pregnancy, a woman can be taken to a good facility where there would be a nurse or a doctor to take care of the delivery where they would have the facility to refer her in case she bleeds a lot and is closer to death. So uh, these are the things that we call, you know, universal health coverage. And I think the country is progressing, but I think there's a scope for more improvement. Talking about the <clears throat> other innovations in health, you know, the innovations that have um, come out of research, I told you about ORS, universal, you know, captured the entire world. And the country, in fact, has come up with some other innovations, some of them done at ICD-DRB, but there's a huge potential for them to be really scaled up, not just in Bangladesh, but also elsewhere. For example, one is, you know, biofortified rice, okay? I talked about zinc deficiency. <clears throat> now, it's uh, good to give zinc supplements, but you can't give it because it's expensive. You have to reach out. But if you have zinc in plenty in the rice that you take, 
So children and adults alike, they take rice every day. No miss. So if we can have a rice that contains more zinc than the usual rice, then that can solve part of the problem. So ICDDRB started to work with the Bangladesh Rice Research Institute, as well as the International Rice Research Institute in Manila. And um, the, you know, the germplasm of rice plant, research was done on that. And the research was done to increase the uptake of zinc from the soil into the rice kernel, okay, mm -hmm. concentration. So when you take this rice, you end up taking more of zinc. So that's a great innovation. That's not genetically modified, but you know, you have to work on the germplasm. So that's an innovation. And I think there are many more innovations coming from Bangladesh that have the potential of reaching out to populations in other countries too. Mm, great. Great, Namid. Um, and just to conclude, uh, you know, there is that very well-known saying by a very well-known person that we are what we eat. <laughs> right. Uh, right. <laughs> so listening to it sounds like if we we can uh, keep eating on the way to becoming better right. we don't have to be what we are we can be something else something yeah, right better. but again again khaled on that note you know uh, just to remind you I, I i'm sure that i don't have to remind you but maybe your friends our friends i mean eating is good but eating judiciously, I think mm. that's the essence of good life. Mm. Those who have a long life and a healthy life, and I have to talk with them. Mm. The essence is that they eat very judiciously. They eat little, by meaning little, they don't overeat. And I think that should be the you know message. Okay. 